Friday Night Racing. On Off The Ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. And you're very welcome along to this week's edition of Friday Night Racing. It's Ger Gilroy and Johnny Ward with you every Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock on all of our social channels. So the best place to get us these days is on the OTB Sports app. And then every Friday evening from 8 o'clock, you can hear us again on Off the Ball on News Talk. And there's only one place that we could go this week, and that was to the announcement during the week that John Ox would be retiring at the end of the current flat season. And I'm thrilled to say John Ox is with us. John, how are you doing? Very well, thanks, Joe. Very well, thank you. Was there um, an emotional element to making this decision? Was it fairly clear-cut from a while back? How did you come to decide that this would be your final season as a trainer? Well, I suppose we've been thinking about it for a few years, and um, it was an easy enough decision to make. You know, we didn't have a <clears throat> we didn't have a very viable business at the moment. Not enough horses, I suppose, anymore, and um, uh, it was time to. Uh, uh, get sense. <laughs> I'm old enough now to have sense, and uh, time to get sense and and uh, uh, stop. And uh, uh, well, I suppose it is a little emotional. Of course, um, you always know the day will come, but uh, um, when it does, I suppose yeah, there's a bit of emotion to it. But you know, you just I I never you know, dwell too much on these things, and I never you know I never think about the past. Uh, you concentrate in the future and what what you have to do tomorrow and next week and next month so uh, it's it's actually a busy time for us now just uh, you know uh, closing down the business and dealing with all the things that have to be done and then we move forward and uh, look to the future and uh, uh, look after ourselves. I always feel like racing isn't something really that you can retire from in that it has such a, a way of life as opposed to a, a job it's definitely as we all know it's it's not nine to five it's not it's not really a job that you go to it's a it's a lifestyle that consumes you so have you thought about what comes next and, and what you'll do next year when the the two-year-old are out in the fields and you're like oh <laughs> uh, no, not really no <laughs> i haven't thought too much about it yet uh we we've as i say uh we're occupying ourselves now with uh, the work at hand at the moment but um so i'm sure we'll take it easy for a little while and uh and then uh, see what emerges. Uh, you know, I've got a biggish property here that uh, hopefully will have a tenant in it, and so there'll be a bit of work for us to uh, look after that and uh, everything that that entails. So when we see what comes along, you know, I'm sure I'll be I'm sure I'll be busy enough, uh, as you say. Uh, you know, working in our line of business, you, yeah, you don't really retire from it. You might retire from one aspect of it, but. Uh, some other aspect uh, you you can you can have some useful work to do in and um, so I'm sure yeah I'm sure I'll be I'll be tipping along as they say and uh, I certainly won't be I won't be uh, uh, twiddling my thumbs looking for something to do no doubt no doubt before we we actually look back at, at some of the highlights and and um, and a little bit of the the backstory to it uh, one last question about the the current situation we find ourselves in was was covid and everything that goes with it an accelerant in terms of making the decision in the end no no absolutely nothing uh, to do with it no covid is when I mean, we've been very lucky in this industry that we've been able to keep going racing as was able to resume re at a reasonable time and uh, racing has uh, been allowed to carry on because it's it's just so well run and so well managed. It's it's sort of a uh, you know uh, an example of what can be done uh, when you put your mind to it. And the protocols were were quite strict and stringent and were generally very very well adhered to by the participants. So uh, we were able to show that race meetings. Uh, could, could be run safely and will continue to be run safely. And we were lucky that we were in an industry that could comply with all the regulations. And, uh, and uh, you know, everybody, I think, had a, a fair shot at, at maintaining their business and uh, having as best we could a fairly normal fairly normal year. Yeah, no, no doubt. Well, look, let's start at the start. When was the decision in your head very clear that you wanted to be a trainer? very early on in my life <laughs> my, my father was a trainer very successful and uh, uh, he uh, uh, yeah he, he I mean I think in those days of course it was very much a thing that uh, maybe children went into their parents profession but not so much these days but 
Uh, but he, yeah, he, 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 my parents thought I might uh, grow up and be a trainer and uh, uh, they suggested I go to veterinary college first and, you know, learn, learn, learn a bit more. And uh, so I followed their advice all along. They didn't have to push me. I was, I was keen to do it. You know, I read all the books. My father was a great reader. Uh, he had all the books from around the world, all the racing and breeding books. So I started reading them at an early age and that's, that's what gives you the sort of inspiration to do it when you when you get a feel for the whole whole thing, and um, so I was uh, I was hooked on it from an early age. It, it always feels when it's handed down like that that there has to be an element of vocation in it as well because if if you don't truly love it, it'll feel like it's been imposed on you that the decision was almost made for you in a way that you were fated to it that there was no free will involved. But actually, if you love it and there is a vocation for it, then it's one of the best things to have the layering on of a generation of knowledge beforehand to lean back on. Yeah, no, I think what you said there is very true. Uh, if, you, if, if, if you were sort of felt forced into training racehorses, now you get pretty resentful pretty quick because it's a, it's a, it's a tough old game, you know, and uh, it's, uh, you get, you know, whether even when you're doing well or appear to be doing well, you'll get plenty of knocks all the time. And uh, if you weren't, yes, as you say, if you weren't, uh, if you didn't look on it as your vocation, if you weren't in love with it, you'd, you'd get sick of it pretty pretty quickly because trainers have to be very determined you know it's that you just you just have to be prepared to stick at it and you know dust yourself down i used to always look at my father he'd come back from the races maybe on a saturday and he'd have had a bad day things wouldn't have gone just quite well for him the first thing he'd do when he'd come back into the house he'd get out the racing calendar and he'd start looking ahead to, you know, he'd have something that would have run disappointing and he'd start planning the next race before he'd sit down to eat something in the evening. You know, he'd have got it out of his system by planning ahead and thinking ahead and not dwelling on it for too long. He might have been a bit annoyed for a while, which he, which he usually was, but but he'd get over it by looking ahead and, and just the determination to crack on regardless and not let things get you down you know that's all trainers need that they do because dealing with defeat you know we talk about this so much that if you've got a good strike rate of 10 percent it's like well oh, that's good if you've got a better strike rate than that, it's absolutely amazing but loads of trainers have lowered than that strike rate and and get by and you do you just have to somewhere find an accommodation that more often than not you're going to be defeated that's right that's right you have to no not every defeat is a is a major surprise, but yeah, you, you you lose more often than you win, and you do have to uh, yeah accept that and uh, not let it bother you. Uh, some trainers do let it bother them much. They're they're sort of too, as they like to call it competitive. I don't know about that word, but people some people are are probably a bit over competitive for their own uh, for their own good. Uh, but um, but uh, but yeah, you have to become a little bit philosophical and. Uh, and just don't let it bother you. And uh, just as I said, determination is, is is what you can't run out of. I have one last question on this before I let Johnny in to, to talk about the, some of the specifics. Um, your training style, having grown up watching your dad's training style, was it automatically similar? Was it automatically different? Did you feel like you had to do something different? Oh, you always look, uh, yeah, you always look to make changes. You know, it's it's something you, you can't um, you can't sit there and say no. This is the one and only way to do it. And uh, uh, and of course, when you're young, you always think you're going to improve on your father's methods. Very often, you come back and you say, God, yeah, no, they, they, he was right all along. And uh, but yes, no. I mean, you, you start off. I mean, there were a lot of good things that uh, people of that generation did, uh, and uh, they were horse people and they they, they they trained horses very well so you you'd certainly always do well to follow what the trainers of that generation were doing and you know you have to remember they had some advantages they had you know very good staff lots of them they had plenty of time they were never rushed uh, they weren't overburdened with lots of race meetings to go to and all that so they they had time to do things in a certain manner which uh, which you know we don't want to ever forget but uh, of course you change every year you change you have to you have to try and improve and uh, move with the times uh, you know learn more of the new uh, scientific evidence that's available and uh, 
uh, yeah, we're constantly changing. Every year when you get to the end, to get to this time of the year, you're thinking about what, what you'll do, what you'll tweak, and what you'll do a little different the next year. So um, it's, it's, it's evolving all the time. And how would you actually characterise or describe your own philosophy and style? What, what was it that you would say the John Ox way of training a horse was? Well, I don't know. I suppose <laughs> there's only one way to train, and that's to try and get do what what is necessary to try and get the best out of every horse for every every owner. It's to try and get the result that the owner requires, and uh, that will be usually, of course, to win. Uh, and it might be to you know keep racing a horse and give the owner a lot of fun, or it might be to. Uh, do well with the horse for a short period of time and, and negotiate a sale for the horse or, you know, a breeder wants to get a black type for a filly or, you know, there are all sorts of different owners might have different objectives and it's the trainer's job to listen to the owners, to know what is in their mind, uh, know what they want, how they want it delivered and uh, to try and get the best result he can for the client. So, but at the end of the day, there's only one way to do all that and that's to treat the horse properly, do what the horse wants to do, what the horse can do. You can't make a horse do what he or she is not able to do. So at the end of the day, you've just got to do what's right by the horse, and that's what will work out for the owner. And uh, it does require time and patience more often than people uh, realize. And, uh, uh, you know, you have to have the owner on side to uh, realize that the horse may need time and patience. And I was always very lucky that I had owners who, who were, you know, in the same, in the same uh, mindset as I was. And um, a lot of horses are rushed, you know. Uh, it's, the, it's the way all around the world now. Everyone wants, wants horses that run early and run fast, and uh, uh, they want the quick return. And... Uh, that's difficult, you know, that's not, uh, the horses don't always want that, uh, but sometimes it's imposed on them. So um, uh, I was lucky enough, I had people that uh, generally, generally were on my side in that regard, but uh, but uh, but then you do have plenty of horses who are bred to, uh, to be sharp and early, and, and it's no problem to them, so it's just to distinguish between the two, the ones that can do it and the ones that don't want to do it. Is, is there a sense of sadness there, John, that you're going out, I suppose, when um, we're, we're, at, we're at probably the most hectic run of Irish race meetings, I would imagine, ever with post-lockdown, because they've been trying to make up for lost time. And I suppose you, you're, you're famed for your modus operandi, which you've mentioned there, of taking time with your horses. And you reference the competitive nature of it nowadays. Maybe you're going out at the right time, in a way, in that... Um, this year, more than ever, was was rushed, and it was an to maybe the way that you train. And is is there a sense of um, the right time in that uh, it, it is happening now? Ah, not really. No, no, I don't think. I know it was a bit of a condensed season this year, but that uh, I wouldn't think had any negative effect on me really. Um, uh, yeah, not ah, not really. I don't think uh, that's. Uh, that's a factor. I think Irish racing certainly is, is competitive, but it was always competitive. It was always hard to win. You just have to have the material to to be be up at the top level, uh, which I don't have now, I suppose, in general. But um, uh, I'm, uh, you know, I don't, I, I can't quite say that now that that's, 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 uh, Anything. I think the right time to get out is the time, <laughs> is, is, is the time it suits yourself to get out, really, mm -hmm. you know, and suits your own circumstances at the time, really, you know. So I think it's competitive now, sure. I think Irish racing is the most competitive it's ever been, but um, uh, you just have to have the, the horses to compete or, or you're in trouble. Well, did you enjoy it as much um, as the game progressed from, we'll say from when your, your father's era of... That, that's a lovely story of him looking towards planning the next race and, you know, having that time with horses. Did you enjoy it as much in recent years? Obviously, you weren't getting maybe the, the calibre of horse, but the way it was evolving and becoming more of a rushed kind of MO, I suppose. Yeah, it, it, look, it's probably not as enjoyable uh, as it used to be because of the... You know the bigger, bigger, bigger workload. But I suppose I, you know, I've had a big workload now for several years and... Uh, 
I, I, I suppose I put up with it. I didn't mind it, but there's no doubt it's it's it was more easy going in my father's time. They didn't mm-hmm. have the volume of racing. For a start, there was no Sunday racing, and uh, well, that used to give people some little breather. Uh, it was nice to have Sundays off. Uh, nowadays, you know, Sunday might be a very busy day. And uh, and there's no let up at all. And of course, there's more bureaucracy, and there's more paperwork, there's more office work. So everything has got tougher. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, it's, it's got tougher to run a business in every way. Anybody running a business, whatever it is, will tell you it's it's tougher and more complicated now than before. So I would say it's. Um, yeah, I would say it's it's not as much fun. Obviously, it wasn't as much fun for me in the last few years, uh, but uh, uh, I did enjoy it uh, up up to a few years ago, I think, um, despite it being tougher. But it certainly was tougher, and uh, I was struck by a comment that I read in the paper, uh, an interview with Barry Hills in England, and uh, he said when when he looks round nowadays, he doesn't see many trainers having fun. Mm. And uh, and it's quite true. I mean, you can imagine it might be bad enough here, but in England with all this wall-to-wall racing and traveling all over the place and poor prize money for the bread and butter races, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's not for everyone. But I've spent my life advising people not to become racehorse trainers, <laughs> and uh, it doesn't make any difference. You know, they still they still want to be racehorse trainers. There's no end of young people coming forward who want to give it a go. So, uh, you know, let them at it, and some of them will be successful. We can't, we shouldn't be discouraging them like, like I've spent a lifetime discouraging them, but, uh, you know, some of them will come through and be very successful, and, and uh, they'll overcome all the the negative aspects of the, of the, of the hard work and the disappointments. Can I, I suppose, yeah, can, sorry, so can I put it to you, though, that if you were to tap yourself on the shoulder in Freshers' Week, in UCD when you were doing veterinarian studies that you would still encourage yourself to go back and, and do what you did that you wouldn't say hey listen give up that training arc oh I'd probably do it again yeah I was <laughs> I was too <laughs> I was too I was too determined and and hooked up on it to, to turn back and uh, yeah I oh, sure look at uh, you know we can all have a little whinge about it but sure wasn't it wasn't it very good for me it, it, things things worked out very well and uh, we have a lot to be grateful for and a lot to be thankful for and uh, uh, I have nothing to complain about maybe training is a bit like um, the US presidency where you know normal age kind of profiles don't apply because if you retire at 70 in normal walks of life people say why didn't you do it five years ago but you must marvel at the longevity of, you mentioned Barry Hills, but like Kevin Prendergast um, is a lot nearer 90 than 70, and uh, he's, he's a Frankel half-sister to Autad that he's probably excited about for next year. You have John Kiley, who broke his leg riding out in his 80s there a few months ago, um, and you have all these characters to whom age is but a number, so it just seems more like timing than kind of um, getting too old for it, if that makes, the, the, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, Kevin is ter- terrific. He's an amazing man. He looks the same to me now as he did 30, 40 years ago. <laughs> and he had a treble last Friday at, at Dundalk. And, uh, uh, yeah, no, just it's his life, you know. He he, he, he doesn't, uh, you know, he doesn't want to retire, I'm sure. He, he enjoys it too much. Uh, and uh, it's part of, it's, it's just another one of his hobbies. He likes it so much, you know. It's not work. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and, uh He's uh, he, well. He's pretty unique, and but he's a, he's a fit man. And John Kiley, the same mar- marvelous man. So, and aged a bit uh, for years. And uh, I'm sorry to hear he'd broken his leg uh, recently. I didn't know that. He wants uh, it kept on the QT, and he. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But um, um, yeah, no, it's uh, yeah, it's a way of life. It's like farming. You know, do farmers ever retire either? You know, so uh, it's it's something that. Some people are happy to keep going out forever, and some of us just reach a time when <laughs> uh, enough is enough, you know. Will you talk I, to us a little bit about the actual magic of seeing a horse that you know is special the first time that you realise it's special? Uh, well, that's what you're always looking for, of course, is, you know, that's what keeps people going, you know, uh, the morning work and uh, spotting something that just might be might be exciting for the future. So. Yeah, that's 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 what keeps keeps trainers getting up in the morning, and uh, that's an. Ah, there you go.
the line is gone. Just as we got to the bit. Johnny, if there's anybody out there who is, and we've got a lot of um, people who are just getting into racing who are watching and uh, listening to this every week, just explain how amazing a career John Ox has had for us, will you? Yeah, we, we just need like uh, these rags for riches stories of handicappers winning group ones and, you know, legends retiring to keep the show as calibre it has been the last couple of weeks because we had like, there was an amazing reaction to Tony Mullins, which I knew halfway through the interview that it was going to get a great reaction and I hope there'll be something similar here. And the way he speaks about his father being a voracious reader, um, he had that kind of, John has that kind of um, bit of an, a, a librarian about him as well or, or even a doctor. He has this so it's very, very nice kind of manner about him, somebody who, who will always be teaching you something. And uh, he's just been a fixture in Irish racing for, for so many decades now from, from Sindar to see the stars, Ridgewood Pearl, um, and I think his, his, his modus operandi is probably just not really the way that training is nowadays. Owners don't necessarily afford to that time. Um, primarily, John would be associated with Aga Khan bred horses, and those horses would be um, bred to improve with time. The likes of Sindar, that you know, he wouldn't have these sharp two-year-olds, so you, can, you, you would be afforded the time to do it. Um, and what happened with See the Stars, I don't think today, I don't think this week is as much sad as if John Ox hadn't gotten See the Stars uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, um, it, it would have been sad then because he would have had a sort of a, a 10 years of, of very little really happening. And it, the way it happened for Michael Canan as well, that was his swan song. Um, so it was marvellous that that horse came along and he, a horse that wasn't straightforward, that could win a guineas and win six group ones in a row and be gone in his coat pretty much by the end of the season to go to different countries, to go to different distances, um, different ground and just keep responding, run the arc just while running pulling the car for half the race um, and that kind of epitomised his, his mastery really that he was able to um, you know just get the best out of a horse because he gave him time and for <laughs> for John Ox to give him six grade group ones in a season would, would be would be actually asking a lot by his standards yet he responded uh, to the question but I suppose he's, he's probably known 50-50 for how good he was as a trainer, but also just the gentleman that he is really. Well, listen, it is Friday Night Racing here and Off the Ball, brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie or follow the Twitter account at HRI Racing. And the hashtag is every racing moment. We're speaking about John Ox because I'm delighted to say uh, John is back with us. We've, we've got a pot of history there while you were away, just for any of our um, casual racing fans or non-racing fans who are watching this week of um, some of the highlight reels. And I think, John, in, in fairness, a lot of times there are great careers and at the end of it people pick out something a little bit off-Broadway. For you, I think it was a, a fairly, uh, it was in lights, it was a, a day in Paris that I think was the thing that you've reached to this week when people have asked you for your own personal highlights. Uh, well, you know, it's hard to pick, pick the highlights, you know, there, there were so many big occasions uh, that went very well for us, um, so many good horses, great horses. In fact, but uh, obviously, you know, see the stars' career was, uh, you know, it was it was a remarkable, uh, remarkable one uh, for the horse to do all he did, and then to win the arc at the end. I mean, all those races were important. You know, people ask me which of his races was the most important. They were all of equal importance because he was such a great horse, and you know, he had this destiny. You felt that he he could go through the year and win win everything we put him in. And to be one of the greats, uh, he has to do that. All the greats were, there were not horses who had one great performance. There were horses who could run up a sequence of, of big wins over different distances. Uh, so to, to uh, win the arc was just such a great relief, and it was, it was so important uh, to win it. So if you had to, if you had to put one above another, it would have been the, the, the win in the arc, of course. Um, I was, uh, as I've said before, I was a great fan of Nijinsky's, uh, uh, you know, which was what forty, almost forty years earlier. And um, when he got beaten in the arc, it was God, it was so disappointing, you know. Uh, so it took it took the gloss off, you know, to some extent off the Triple Crown win. You'd have liked him to go through completely unbeaten, but um, so, and the arc is a race that things can go wrong in. Everybody knows that. It's, it's a difficult race, so so to get through that uh, was just such a huge relief, and we felt so, so we felt so uh, privileged and lucky uh, to to have been a part of it, that, that you know, we, we were there to see him through. 
I think one of, one of the best aspects of the See the Star story in terms of your training of him, John, is that he was beaten on debut as well, which is always one of my favourite parts of the story because it was like, this is there's a long road ahead here, no need to panic. Yeah, well, he, 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 he probably, even though he was, you know, he was having a nice educational run, he wasn't really wound up. We knew he was a good horse and that he, he'd run a good race and that he might win. And he just got into a little bit of a pocket during the race. And Michael, Michael always, particularly in the latter part of his career, he, he had this expression, we'll, 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 give him a leave, we'll leave him with a good taste in his mouth. You know, he always yeah. rode two-year-olds gently, first time out, educated them, and maybe gave them one flick of the whip. Uh, but uh, he, wouldn't, uh, he, he wouldn't knock a horse about too much. And that's the way, that's the way it should be. And um, uh, he, um, he, uh, he came out then and won his maiden easily the second time. And, of course, that's an advantage, too. It means then by the time you go into a, the big race, which in his case was the Beresford Stakes, you know, you've had two previous runs. Uh, sometimes you go in after a maiden win and the horse hasn't learned enough and he's not able to deal with it. So, so he had a perfect, yeah, he had a perfect start, and uh, and uh, it was uh, a help to him. The, the, the relationship with Mike Canan uh, at that time, who was obviously nearing the end of his career, you said it was destiny about see the stars and maybe, you know, that the two of you could combine with this horse um, was very much part of that destiny. And what role did he play in achieving what he achieved, um, particularly, I suppose, winning the arc in truly extraordinary circumstances? Well, sure, it was a great blessing to have Michael Canan ride a horse like that in all those big races and all those different tracks. Uh, he had been there so many times before over a long career. Uh, he knew, you know, he knew every blade of grass on these tracks and he, he knew you know he, he knew what was ahead and he wasn't overawed by any occasion i'm sure any jockey would get a little nervous before riding a horse in a big race like that but you wouldn't you wouldn't know it with michael he had of course he had great confidence in the horse and uh, he had you know he had the nerves of steel for for the big occasion and uh, uh you know he, he he knew what to do and he knew what to expect and uh could deal with any. Every, I mean, the, the ride in the arc was no. That was that was a, a great one because um, you know the horse took off a bit or was a bit keen for. He went for early on. He went from having a good position to having a, a moderate position, maybe. Uh, uh, but uh, he he knew he could do that. He had to get the horse anchored and get him back behind a few more. And uh, uh, he uh, he was still close enough all the way, according to Michael. He was never too worried. And he knew the horse would have the gears to pick up. But you know, to make those decisions uh, in a split second early in a race, you you just need the need the jockey with um, the experience and the and the nerve for it. You I always think if you sorry, Joe, I always think if you if you put a heart rate monitor on a on a punter during a race, it would tell you whether he or she is going to be a successful gambler or not. But what were you like in that race? Were you uh, was your heart absolutely pounding, uh, turning into the straight, or were you as chilled out as you seem to be every other day of the week? Ah, uh, well, you <laughs> you might be you might be you might be chilled out on the outside, but you're not always you're not always as chilled out. No, but you're always anxious uh, before a race. Yeah, you know, a big race like that, you have to be anxious. You get, you know, I know you go into it with a sort of philosophical mindset that well, whatever happens happens. There's nothing you can do about it anymore. But uh, I was a little anxious there, I must say, uh, a little anxious early on when I saw him pulling. But then when I saw him getting him back and getting him settled. I was never too worried. Uh, I was anxious just when he straightened up. There's a point, you can see it, uh, when they straighten up uh, at the top of the straight and he makes a move around a horse called Getaway. Uh, and when he got around him, I was happy uh, because if he hadn't got around that first horse, you know, it would have been, you know, he would have been in a bit of a spot. He would have, he wouldn't have been able to get going as early. Now he probably still could have come round the whole field and won easily anyway. But, but I was anxious until he got past him, and and uh, Pellier was on getaway, and they were going for the same gap. And and Mick says he, he he looped him. You know, he went, he he was behind him, but he they were both going for the same gap. But he just went around him and got there first. And Pellier told him afterwards, he said yeah, he had never been passed by a horse going so fast in his life. Mm. And uh, when he got through that, uh, I knew then he'd, he'd, he'd weave his way through the rest of them. So I was uh, kind of relieved. I'm sure my heart was going pretty fast, but uh, I, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't counting the beats. 
When did you know See the Stars was special? Like, was it before the, the debut? Was it even before that? Was it the first time you did a bit of work? Like, what's that relationship like with See the Stars from the start? Well, it was always a special horse. It was always a special yearling. Uh, lovely to break, beautiful temperament, you know, very easy to ride, really quick learner, clever horse. A lot of good horses are clever. They, they, they instinctively seem to take to it. And um, he was always, uh, he was always a, a very promising horse. And first time he rode, you know, Michael rode him work. He could tell that there was there was a big engine here. So he never let us down, um, and uh, you have great hopes. But you see, you never know until you put them put them to the test. You never know until they race, and then they race again. You put them into a better race. You can never be sure. Uh, the race course is, is the test, and uh, that question you've asked me is the most common question people ask me, and um, and uh, my answer is always the same. You know, you just you just have to wait, and uh, I think. Uh, you know, when he won the Guineas was a big milestone. Obviously, when he could prove that he could win a Guineas at a mile, uh, we knew we could have a Guineas Derby winner. Um, then, when a month later he could go up to Epsom, go up in distance 50% on a completely different track and win easily, then we knew we had, you know, we we had the horse. And uh, uh, it was from then on. Then we just had to hope that we wouldn't have any bad luck or bad weather or whatever and that uh, if we could keep him healthy uh, that he could win he could probably win all the other races when, and you're, when you're in the middle of that John what's that actually like because it, it's in, in other sports it's being in a flow state or in the zone when absolutely everything is perfect and everybody understands that it's perfect and you kind of you try not to overanalyze it or think about it too much but it's different in horse racing where you're plotting and planning and everything every day you know, when things are going well, there's there's no risk. But when and things are going well, everything's a risk as well. Yeah, well, sure, that's it. Every every day, uh, yeah, it was. It, look, it was a privilege to 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 be in that position with him and to plan his work every day and to watch over him and uh, you know everybody, great staff, a great lad looking after him and great people riding him. Uh, uh, one rider in particular rode him out every day, and then Michael rode him work nearly all the time. Fran Berry rode him a couple of times. Uh, but um, you know everybody was there for the horse, and uh, yeah, you had to, you know, you thought long and hard about everything he was doing. Uh, but he had his routine, and uh, um, it was a privilege actually to. I know it's, it was nerve-wracking, you know, particularly at the end, uh, coming up to the arc. You know, you just wanted nothing to go wrong, and I was probably uh, more anxious than I normally would be. Yeah. But uh, you, you, you certainly would, because you know, look at anything can happen. He could stand on a stone. He could have a bruise. He could have, you know, could 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 do anything uh, with horses. You never you never know. Uh, he could get a temperature or something, you know. So, which he did on St Patrick's Day, actually, not long before the Guineas. Uh, he got a, quite a high temperature. I nearly died when I got the news. But you know, so all these things can crop up. And uh, it's it, it is it is anxious. Uh, it is anxious, uh, an anxious time. But it was also a privilege to be able to watch him every day, to plan his work, and just just watch him. He was such a beautiful animal, and such a beautiful athlete, and such perfection. You know, it was uh, that was the most pleasurable pleasurable part for me was just training him and just being in his presence and just watching him. Um, Great privilege just to be there in the jeep, just walk driving along beside him as he walked along, and that was that was a real pleasure. The race days and the winds they were were a relief, uh, not not a pleasure if you like. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pleasure to look back and to. I was going to say it, it seems almost like now it's more enjoyable than at the time because there is the constant pressure. We have something unbelievably special. We've worked so hard to get to this point. We just need to go and deliver it now. But that stress, as opposed to now, it's like, look what we did. Look at that amazing thing that we did. Oh, there's no doubt it was stressful, all right. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's supposed to stress that you you are quite uh, like you're quite like to have and might, might like to have more often. But but of course, uh, you couldn't have a second horse like like him, I suppose. But but yeah, it was stressful. Um, but um, weren't we lucky to have that stress? And uh, certainly, yes, when you. When you went past the post in the ark, you just say to yourself, "My goodness, 
imagine that, you know, imagine having a horse like that that can win all those races and where we got there without uh, some setback to derail the whole thing. Weren't we very lucky? You know, you just feel so grateful when uh, when when he goes past the post and the arc. It's just, it was a feeling that, uh, you know, you, you, you might, you would, you would think you would never have. This might be a silly question, but... It, it you know, at that stage of your career, you were also very mature and worldly. You'd seen so much, you'd been around the world, you'd had so much experience that maybe if it had come a little earlier in your career, you might not have been as ready for it. Uh, well, yeah, but maybe if you have something like that happen to you too young, you mightn't appreciate it the same way. I know, yes, you're quite right. I'd say it's, um, um, uh, I don't know. Uh, Ian Balding was quite young when he trained uh, Mill Reef. Uh, I think he was in his early 30s. Uh, so I don't think it had any <laughs> it had any negative effect on him. Uh, but I certainly appreciated it anyway. Uh, for sure I did uh, because you know you know how hard trainers work in general. A lot of them never there could be good trainers and they never get their hands on a good horse. I was lucky to have had uh, you know some great horses before that but to come along then and have the best of the lot um, was certainly a great blessing. Did, did being a vet have an impact on how you put the horse's welfare at the centre of what you were doing, or did you go off to become a vet because you always were going to put the horse's welfare at the centre of what you were doing? Uh, well, it just uh, I don't think it, it had any direct effect uh, later on on what I was doing. Uh, but um, I, I did veterinary at a time when, you know, uh, it was a great benefit to have that little bit of extra knowledge and understand understanding more the knowledge that you could explain things to your clients when things are going wrong. Uh, you know, people had a bit more confidence in you when you were a young trainer. You know, they used to say, oh, well, John knows what he's doing. John's a vet. Uh, but it mightn't have always been relevant uh, at all. Uh, but it was a help when you were when I was young and starting off. And uh, it's always a help to have a little bit of extra knowledge and understanding. But I think everybody these days has a you know, a uh, good layman's understanding of veterinary and medical matters. So I don't think it's um, other trainers are at any disadvantage because they're not vets, you know. So, um, uh, but yeah, there was always a big veterinary input, I suppose, into things we were doing here. And uh, it certainly did help us uh, along the way, at, uh, uh, particularly in the earlier years. What would be your favorite memories, John, apart from See the Stars? Oh, I don't know. Um, it's um, uh, always your first big win. Uh, my first classic was uh, in 1987, uh, the year my father died. Uh, I won the ledger with Eurobird. I was owned by Gerald Jennings, who was a uh, good owner of my father's and myself's, uh, myself. And uh, the year my father's last year training, he won the Oaks at the Curra there with Sorbus. And she was controversially dis disqualified. And when I say controversially, I, it's an understatement. It was, you know, a, a big mistake. Sorry to interject. I was actually told about that today, and or sorry, during the week, um, by one of the the erudite judges of the turf, and he said it was unbelievable at the time. Ireland was in a pretty bad way, and it was actually considered um, a decision to sway it in terms of British racing being more important to Irish racing at the time, and nobody could get their head around it. Well, look, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, say too much uh, about it, really. <laughs> That's saying a lot. But uh, it was just a huge mistake. Uh, if, if you saw it today, you would, there wouldn't even be a steward's inquiry. There was mm -hmm. absolutely no, there was absolutely no interference. Uh, but the rules were different then, uh, which uh, we won't delay, dwell on, I suppose, too much. But it encouraged own, uh, stewards to disqualify horses if they thought something might have happened, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and. Uh, uh, they didn't. They didn't uh, always. Uh, uh, you know, they didn't use their heads much. Uh, they used them in the wrong way sometimes. But look at there were a lot of decent men uh, on that panel at the time, and I knew them all afterwards and was friendly with them. And they, they just made a mistake. They were probably led a little up the garden path. But it affected my father badly. He was very annoyed and upset, and it was in his last year. And the Oaks had been a lucky race for him. It would have been the fifth time he had won one. And uh, so anyway. Uh, shortly afterwards, we were able to win the ledger for Mr. Jennings, and it was my first 
classic winner. That's always a big, a big occasion. It was a great thing. And then Richard Pearl in 1995 was uh, the first really star international horse I had, and that was a, that was a big thing uh, for me. So they were they were important. And of course, after that, well, if you look at this, like asking you which which of your children do you prefer? Yeah. You know, you can't put. You can't have one of your top horses ahead of the rest. They were all they were all great and all very welcome. I suppose you'll reflect as well. I don't know if you're ever if you're going to write a book on on your career or whatever. But you'll reflect on the magic of working at the Cora and I suppose anyone who's not really aware of it, just the history of the place, the people you meet, generation of after generation, even millennia really after millennia of, of horses running up um, on that plane and being part of that. Oh, of course, yeah. Well, no, the Curra, Curra gallops are dear to me, and uh, uh, you know there's, there have been steady improvements all through the years, and uh, to where they are now, which is you know at a at a different level. When I think back to what my father and his generation had, had here available, and they always had the great gall- grass gallops, all right, but they didn't have the all-weather facilities and the winter facilities that we have now. So yeah, no, it's it's a great pleasure. You know, if it's a fine day in particular, and you're and uh, you're out on, on the, in the morning, it does make a difference when your horses are good and when they're <laughs> just worked well. You know, yeah. if you've had something that's disappointed you, you know, the the nice scenery and out in the fresh air, you know, don't, don't seem to think too much about yeah. that. But I can tell you, when horses are working well and the ground is good and the uh, the the weather is nice. Yeah, we, we it's a privilege to be. Uh, it's a privilege to be there. Well, I hope when the crowds are back, they get an opportunity to welcome you back to give you a proper send off. That's the one thing I think that, for anybody who is uh, calling it a day at the moment, when the crowds aren't there, aren't there, that they don't get the emotion from the crowds for people who have supported you and watched your success and who have been you know emboldened themselves or inspired by the success that you've had on foreign fields. We didn't even talk about some of the stuff that you've done around the world as well. So it's been brilliant spending time with you this afternoon, John. Thanks so much for talking to us and congratulations on an absolutely amazing career. Well, thank you very much. You're very kind. And there's one thing I would like to say, and you touched on it there, uh, we've had a tremendous number of very nice messages from people. And, um, you know, just in case some of them are listening, uh, we are overwhelmed by by their good wishes and uh, would like to thank them uh, very much for, for their kind words. Well, listen, congratulations again, and thanks a million for talking to us today. Very good. Thank you very much. That's uh, the legend that is John Ox, who has called time on. Um, it is a legendary career, Johnny. You know, when we were doing the Kildare Mount Rushmore, um, Willie McCreary was definitely stumping for John Ox, and just the level of achievement of that one season of absolute greatness. Like, there's a few similar levels of greatness. Maybe there was a short period of time where... Roy McElroy was at that level, but like um, what See the Stars did that year in all sports is not really comparable. I, I don't know that many other Irish people have ever reached that level of greatness. No, no, he he may have been may have been you know the best. Some people would still say he's better than Frankel. Um, they we never know, but we we memorably had Mike Canan on, and he he wasn't even uh, thinking about it. It was like definitely See the Stars, but. Um, you know, you can you can get these high achievers in life that um, you could take or leave in terms of having a drink with or a coffee with or even a conversation with, and you admire their success, but um, you wouldn't get too you know worked up about it. But um, John Ox absolutely screamed class as an individual. You know, his message during the week, um, in terms of his retirement, instead of you know delving into a load of self platitudes about the horses he trained and all his achievements uh, he actually referenced the fact that he just was worried that his uh, workers wouldn't get new employment and I, I thought that was an absolute measure of the man Johnny Murta said they never had a bad word in all those years I believe that in a heartbeat as a journalist when I rang him sometimes you'd ring trainers or jockeys and you'd be kind of you'd be slightly put in a uh, your, your, your head in your hands just hoping that they wouldn't be in bad form it was never a question with him and being able to talk to him that year of see the stars I mean kind of following the progress from the guineas to the derby to the eclipse right up the way to the arc and you know the pleasure that he was deriving of that but it was the same as if you were ringing him about a 0 to 60 in Dundalk tonight um, because he was just measured calm relaxed and you know the he re- I thought some of the things he said there just in terms of trainers that are, you know is it as enjoyable now but also the fact that they get so up and down after a result and it was a, it was a lovely 
thought of, you know, when you have a bad day, look to the future because, there, you know, there's always another day coming, hopefully, and, you know, there, there is a chance to right a wrong. And um, anyone who would say a bad word about John Knox, um, you just wouldn't have any interest talking to them. And I, I'd love if he wrote a book maybe on his career, but also I'd love if he um, were used in some sort of uh, media context as well because I could listen to the man all day. Now, let's move on. Thunder Moon finished third in the Dewhurst at Newmarket, adding some prize money to the Toad Irish Injured Jockeys Fund, which grows to €2,310 this week. We have another €100 Euro tote bet for the Irish Injured Jockeys. It's a reminder that the tote.ie customers can get the tote guarantee, tote versus SP, on all Irish and UK racing. Check out tote.ie for more. What have we yeah. got? Cracking crack racing tomorrow, obviously, in Ascot. Um, we don't have time maybe to go through it. I'm staying closer to home. Thunder Moon, I'd definitely advise backing him for the Guineas next year. He was bogged down a bit on the ground, as we kind of half thought he would, but he ran a blinder. Um, tomorrow I'm going with Grimstar in the 205 at Ballon Road. Um, it's trained by Sam Curling, very good trainer. I couldn't find anything to beat this horse. I did the spotlight for the racing post, and I just think he'll win. All right, Grimstar, Ballon Road, each way mm. or on the nose? On the nose, sure, yeah. None of that nonsense. Um, you know, let's 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 get a good let's get a good winner for the for the toes and uh, enjoy the 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 magical race and really and magical herself at, at Ascot tomorrow and uh, yeah, start life uh, post John Ox's retirement, I guess. Friday night racing and off the ball brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie. Johnny, good stuff. Thanks a million. We'll Thanks, see you sir. again next week. See you soon, Drew. Thank Every you. Friday afternoon here at three o'clock on uh, OTB Sports. Right across across uh, our various platforms. You can get us on the OTB Sports app. And then every Friday evening on News Talk from eight o'clock as well. See you next week. Take care. Friday night racing on off the ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie.